It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, before I um before I give my first question, I'd just like to take note that it's Sikh Heritage Month, the month of April, and wish everybody from a, a very diverse Sikh community across uh, our province a happy Sikh Heritage Month. <laughs> my question, Speaker, is for the Acting Premier. Late Friday, the Ford government announced that they're cutting funding for six over, uh, pre overdose prevention sites. Public health experts said that the 21 sites uh, that the government was originally allowing was grossly inadequate, and now we're down to 15. The government has acknowledged that these sites save lives. In the midst of an opioid crisis that's gripping our province, how can this government justify this cut? Questions to the Acting Premier. Minister Thank you, uh, Speaker. To the Community Safety and Correctional Services Minister. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, uh, it, it's interesting how the NDP uh, choose to um, spin the announcements. On Friday, we actually announced 15 safe injection sites. Uh, they are located across Ontario, as they should be. Toronto, Ottawa, London, Hamilton, Guelph, Niagara Region, Kingston, Thunder Bay. You know, it's important that we get this right because this is only one component to making sure that our streets are safe and our people are safe. These sites are part of a larger process and a larger um, ability for our government to make sure that when people have addictions, Response. when people need help, they have a government who's willing to step up and make sure that um, those addiction services and treatments are available to them. I'm proud of the fact that we've announced those 15 sites um, as the member. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's nothing more than basic math. 21 minus 15 equals six sites closed by this government. That's what that means, Speaker. More than 1,200 people died of the opioid-related overdoses in 2017. This is a public health disaster. And if you have a loved one struggling with addiction, you know that these sites can be the difference between life and death, literally. The government knows this. The Minister of Health certainly knows this. Will the Acting Premier tell the Premier today that this decision needs to be reversed and he needs to fund the overdose, overdose prevention sites required across the province to save lives? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Through you, you know the the NDP continue to um, throw discontent. You know, with the the first tranche of 15 were announced on Friday. We are actively working with communities who need the services to make sure that the entire wraparound process is there. This is not just about injection sites. This is about making sure that people who need the services for treatment, who have access to, to treatment, uh, it will be there when we need it. And you know, the, the member opposite, the NDP, uh, seem to believe that the only pathway are uh, consumption treatment services. On our our government believes that when people need help, when people are reaching out for help, we want to wrap around those services. We want to make sure that the treatment is there, that options Response. are available, so that the drug use does not continue and our streets become safer. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, we need to protect our streets and we need to protect our people to make sure they get the treatment they need. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, when Speaker, when someone dies of an overdose, they don't have any options left. They no longer have life left. The opioid crisis is killing people on a daily basis in our province. At a time when the government should be taking the lead and trying to save lives, instead they're cutting support to people and families who desperately need it. And they're abandoning communities from Ottawa to Thunder Bay and leaving them to deal with a public health crisis all on their own. How many more people have to die before the government reverses this decision, decision rather, and takes this crisis seriously and funds the needed overdose prevention sites from one end of the province to the other? Members, please take your seats. Minister. Speaker, I think it's important that we uh, we turn down the rhetoric a bit. And again, I will I will let the people of Ontario know Position that there are currently and will continue to be six uh, consumption treatment services sites in the city of Toronto. In the city of Ottawa, there continues to be service. In London, 
in Hamilton, in Guelph, in Niagara, in Kingston, in Thunder Bay. Applications continue to come in. Applications continue to be reviewed. But let me be clear. This is not just about consumption sites. We have to also focus on treatment to make sure that people have the, right. the treatment that they need to get out of a life of drugs, to get out of on a pathway to be safe and our communities to be safe. Speaker, I'm proud of the work that our Minister of Health has been doing on this very critically important right. file. There is no one Response. more qualified in the province of Ontario to make sure we get it right, and I'm proud to stand behind Christine Re Elliott as our Deputy Premier and Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question. Again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is for the Premier, but I have to say I'm devastated by that response, and I think it's this government pulling the wool over their own eyes and not acknowledging the crisis that is upon us that's been ongoing for years now. To the Acting Premier, Speaker, last week 1,500 women and men in Windsor learned that they would be losing their jobs at the Chrysler Assembly Plant. Can the Acting Premier explain how the Ford government is responding to yet another devastating announcement of job loss in Ontario's auto sector? The Acting Premier. To the uh, Minister of uh, Economic Development. Uh, Please. Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, there was good news and bad news uh, last week on the auto front, uh, Mr. Speaker. There was a great announcement uh, in Cambridge yeah, yeah. with Toyota, where they announced uh, a new line of RAV4s, but there was devastating news at the same time at FCA in Chrysler. You know, it's been 15 long years of liberal mismanagement here in Ontario that has put those jobs in jeopardy and put jobs in uh, Oshawa in jeopardy as well, Mr. Speaker. I can tell you that we've been in constant communication with FCA since we became the government of Ontario, working with them to ensure that Ontario became a more friendly environment for them business. to do business in, Mr. Speaker. And I can tell you that the introduction Response. today of the federal government's carbon tax does nothing to encourage future, future expansion in Ontario when it comes to our auto sector or any manufacturing jobs, as a matter of fact. Thank you. Supplementary. Families hit hard by job loss want to know that their government will fight for their jobs and the next generation of auto jobs here in Ontario. But what they've seen from the Ford government hasn't inspired a lot of confidence, Speaker. When GM announced that they'd be abandoning production after nearly a century in Oshawa, the Premier shrugged and said, they're gone, they're done, there's nothing we can do. Over 4,000 auto sector layoffs have been announced since this Premier took office, and hundreds more of spin-off jobs are going to follow. Does the Acting Premier think their plan is actually working? The Minister, Minister of Government and Consumer Relations has to come to order. Minister to reply. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that in constant conversations, not with just with FCA or, or General Motors, but with all of the automakers here in Ontario, they will tell us loud and clear there is a change when it comes to the uh, uh, focus of the government of Ontario. For 15 long years, the previous Liberal government was bringing in policies that was making it more difficult for them to be competitive in Ontario. Those same policies, Mr. Speaker, that were making them uncompetitive were supported by the NDP, the official opposition here today. The federal government has come in today with a carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, which is making it uncompetitive for automakers and all manufacturers in Ontario. The NDP wants to not just have the highest carbon tax in Canada or North America, they want to have the highest carbon tax on the globe, Mr. Speaker. Response. Now, that is going to make Ontario an uncompetitive jurisdiction. We've been doing everything we can to make sure that Ontario is open for business yeah, yeah. and open for jobs, and that includes jobs in the auto sector. Thank you. The final supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, last week the Premier said the auto sector needs to react to the market. At a time when the auto sector is embracing new technology, clean energy, and reducing emissions, the Ford government scrapped the rebates for cars like the Chrysler Pacifica that was manufactured at that Windsor plant. And they've ignored industry experts who said that this would hurt sales. So now they are reaping what they sowed. The Premier says car makers should follow the market trends. Why is he ignoring the market trends, Speaker? Minister. Members, please take their seats. Minister to reply. Mr. Speaker, uh, to the member opposite, maybe the NDP believes that the government should be paying for people's vehicles. We don't believe that the government should be paying for people's Agreed. vehicles. Yeah, yeah. We are here. We are here to create an environment where those automakers can be successful. And we've been working with FCA, we've been working with General Motors, Toyota, Honda, and Ford to ensure that we're doing everything we can to make them competitive. But we're not going to buy people's vehicles for them, Mr. Speaker. We're going to get rid of the job-killing, regressive cap-and-trade carbon tax that the Wynn government brought in. We are lowering electricity rates in Ontario, and that's why last week the Minister of Energy sitting right behind me, uh, committed to reviewing electricity rates specifically for the auto sector. That's why we got rid of Bill 148, Mr. Speaker. That was driving Response. businesses out of Ontario at a record pace. We're doing everything we can to make on, on Ontario a competitive jurisdiction yeah. for building cars and trucks. Here, here. Talk. Greenland, here we go again. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is for the Acting Premier, but I can tell you what New Democrats believe in is saving good jobs and helping people to have a more affordable life and participate in a greener economy, Speaker. That's what we believe in. Here's what people are worried about uh, when they, when the, with good auto jobs in our province. Other jurisdictions are fighting, fighting to attract investment in next-generation vehicles and clean technology. The Ford government is fighting electric car makers in court and scrapping incentives to buy Ontario cars like the, uh, the Chrysler Pacifica that is built in Windsor. Other jurisdictions are fighting GM's decision to move production. The Premier says the ship has sailed. Why does the government think this is a plan? that's working when 4,000 people are losing their jobs. Questions to the Acting Premier. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The federal government's bringing in a carbon tax in Ontario today. In case you hadn't noticed, that's going to drive up the cost of everything, everything we buy, including gasoline at the pumps, Mr. Speaker. And the NDP don't think that's enough. They want to have the most expensive carbon tax on the planet, Mr. Speaker. How do you think that is going to impact vehicle sales here in Ontario? The member opposite asked specifically about alternative fuels. I can tell you that we're working with these automakers in our Driving Prosperity Auto Plan. It's the first phase of our auto plan, which makes investments into research and innovation, training for new jobs in the auto sector, Mr. Speaker, which is, exa is exactly what those in the auto sector told us that they needed. They needed the retraining Response. so they can update their employees, their hardworking men and women, to create the vehicle of the future. That's how we're investing in our auto sector, Mr. Speaker, the largest carbon no, tax on the planet. That doesn't do that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary. Well, what the government's done, Speaker, is taken away people's options and choices because they've gotten rid of the rebate, and now they can't go to electric vehicles because they can't afford it. It's about affordability, Speaker. That's what it's about. People want a government that is ready to fight for good auto jobs today and the next generation of Ontario's auto industry. Instead, they see a premier whose message to auto workers is, your jobs are gone, the ship has sailed. For the 1,500 people who learned that they're losing their jobs last week, license plates that say open for business sounds like a pretty sick joke. Will the government admit that their job strategy isn't working? Stop pretending that slapping a campaign slogan on a license plate is a substitute for a plan and start working on a strategy to fight for these jobs and the next generation of auto manufacturing for our province. Stop the clock.
I'm going to ask the government side to allow the opposition members to ask their question without yelling across the floor at them, such that I can hear the questions. And I'll start calling you out by name if need be again. And if need be, we'll move to warnings. Start the clock. <laughs> Minister Dr Thanks very much. Maybe uh, the Leader of the Opposition hasn't seen the StatsCan numbers, Mr. Speaker. 132,000 full-time jobs have been created in Ontario. Under our watch, 132,000 jobs have been created, Mr. Speaker. You know, while the NDP was out there calling on people to boycott, to boycott vehicles that were made by General Motors in Ontario, we were busy working with General Motors to ensure that they would continue to invest in Ontario, invest on the vehicle of the future. That's what they're doing. Hundreds of jobs are coming to the Innovation Centre at General Motors in Markham, and I know the folks in Markham that represent Markham on our side in our government are excited about that because we are working with those automakers for future investment in Ontario. Fine. The NDP can boycott vehicles. They can call for the highest car carbon tax on the planet, that's not going to create investment in Ontario. We're open for business and creating jobs. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Whitby. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. Speaker, today is the first day legal bricks and mortar cannabis stores are permitted to open their doors in Ontario. On this side of the House, Speaker, we know that it must be a priority to protect our kids, keep our roads and communities safe, and combat the illegal market, including illegal stores and online delivery services. Could the minister please tell the legislature what people should expect as we begin to see legal stores? Minister Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Whitby for the question. We know that one of the best ways to combat illegal markets is to ensure that people are able to access legal cannabis grown by producers licensed by Health Canada. Now, unfortunately, due to the national cannabis supply shortage created by the federal government, we ended up taking the responsible approach and introduced a temporary cap of 25 stores to ensure the private retail outlets will have enough supply to meet customer demand. We expect to see 10 of those 25 stores open today, with others opening in the days and weeks to come. In the meantime, customers can purchase cannabis from our licensed stores or the Ontario Cannabis website, OCS.ca, which they can identify by the Ontario Authorized Retail seal that all stores in the OCS website display. We're taking response. a responsible approach and remain committed to moving to an open allocation of licenses once we have certainty surrounding the federally regulated supply of cannabis. Supplementary. Speaker, I would like to uh, thank the minister for that information. I would also like to understand what the government is uh, doing to shut down these illegal stores that we're still seeing in some communities. Speaker, we've all seen reports that suggest some or most of these illegal stores have ties to and are funding organized crime. I believe that they are a dangerous and serious threat to our communities. Speaker, my constituents in Whitby know that this government is committed to keeping our communities safe. Can the minister please tell us what Ontario is doing to close the doors of these illegal stores? Minister Finance. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Um, thank you for the uh, question from the member from Whitby. I know that this is something that is very uh, near and dear to his heart because he wants to keep his community safe. Since October 17th of last year, we have seen 190 illegal stores closed. We know that illegal stores have connections with organized crime mm -hmm. and are incredibly dangerous to our communities. That's why the OPP has been working proactively with our municipal police services to shut down these illegal pot shops. We've already seen police lay over 260 charges under the Ontario's Cannabis Control Act against people selling cannabis illegally. We've also seen over 30 charges laid against landlords for allowing their properties to be used for Response. illegal stores. 
and we've had over 100, 100 charges laid against people for purchasing cannabis from illegal sources. If you want to purchase, purchase cannabis, you need to be certain that you are shopping at a licensed retailer. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Acting Premier. Ontarians want to have their say on the government's new health bill, which opens the door to unprecedented levels of for-profit delivery of health care. 1,594 Ontarians applied for a spot to speak to the bill, but the government limited the number of presenters to just 30. Ontario is a democracy. The government never put out any discussion papers on these changes. They never put out any public consultations on these changes. Why is the government so afraid to let Ontarians have a say in the future of our health care system? Questions for the Acting Premier. The um, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, I understand that in politics we are not always going to agree, but I know the member opposite well, I believe, and I know how committed she is to making sure that a health care system is patient-centered and is going to actually help that patient travel through the continuum of care, from assessment to treatment to palliative all the way through. And as I said previously, you know, the, the Minister of Health, the two excellent parliamentary assistants who sit be, behind me, have been actively engaged with talking to Ontarian residents, to talking to people who are on the front line providing these services and trying to find the best pathway to make Spons. sure that we get to a patient-centered model. Because at the end of the day, we may disagree on how we do it, but I think we all understand in this chamber that ultimately it must be. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. My office has been receiving calls from Ontarians from across the province. They want to share their experience. They want to share their ideas at the committee hearing for the government's bill. Natalia from Mississauga lives with a chronic condition and frequently finds herself in the emergency room. She wants to have her say. She wants to share some solutions. Kathy from Toronto has been waiting for three months for home care since her husband hip was replaced. She's been paying out of pocket. She wants to share her experience and her ideas. And Lena from Scarborough wants to ask who to complain to when her long-term care home doesn't hire qualified PSW. Those are only three of the 1,564 people who ask to present on the government's health bill but will never have a chance to be heard. Why is Question. this government doesn't want to hear from Natalia, from Kathy, or from Lena? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. As you know so well, uh, there is a component of the public consultation period that includes written submissions. I would include those individuals to come forward with their stories because, frankly, they will reinforce the need for why we need yeah, to absolutely. do this very trans transformational work. You know, I, I'm going to give a, a very personal example. The Minister of Health uh, recently um, visited the Headwaters Healthcare Centre in Orangeville, and she spoke to paramedics. She spoke to um, crisis intervention people. She spoke to police officers. She spoke to um, individuals who actually work on the front line in our emergency as paramedics and talked about how the opportunity to coordinate that care, from, as I said, from assessment right through to palliative, is so critical to make sure that the Response. patient is always at the uh, front and forefront of, of what we do. The, uh, the, the two parliamentary assistants are... are very capable uh, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health have been doing that work. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener South Hustler. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Ontario has the best auto workers in the world. More than 100,000 men and women go to work each and every day in our auto sector in Ontario building the cars and the parts that drive our economy and our communities. The Minister, Premier and members of her caucus joined some of those hardworking men and women in my riding of Kitchener-South Hespler on Friday. 
They stood alongside Toyota executives, community members, and our frontline auto workers to celebrate the launch of the new Toyota RAV4. Can the minister outline for the House the importance of the announcement for Ontario's auto sector? Minister of Economic Development, Jobs, Creation and Trade. Thanks, Speaker. It was uh, great to be there along with the member who asked the question and her colleagues in the Kitchener-Waterloo-Cambridge area for this exciting announcement that Toyota made on Friday. And the Premier was there as well, of course, meeting with uh, those great auto workers who do such a fantastic job, those great jobs that are putting food on the table, putting kids through college and university and just making mm -hmm. life better. You know, it's exciting to see this kind of an announcement being made at Toyota with the launch of the RAV4 there, and it was great to be there to celebrate with them. It's a great facility. You know, Mr. Speaker, the RAV4 is the best-selling SUV in North America, and the Toyota plants in Cambridge and Woodstock have won 16 wow. JD Power Awards for vehicle quality. Our government's glad to see that Toyota is committed to building the RAV4 right here in Ontario. And, Mr. Speaker, that's not the only good news that's coming from Toyota. Stay tuned. There's more good news coming from Toyota very soon yeah, yeah. here in Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. 9,000 people work at the Toyota plants in Cambridge and Woodstock. This announcement was an opportunity for them to celebrate the hours and hours of work that they put in every week, making some of the best cars in the world. But we know that our auto sector in Ontario has been falling behind. The news from FCA Windsor last week is a reminder of just that. I know that our government is committed to creating an environment where automakers want to invest and create jobs. So could the minister please inform this House what we are doing to support our auto sector and make more Ontario more competitive for auto investment? Minister. Thanks uh, to the member again for the question, Speaker. While Friday was a great day for workers uh, at Toyota in Cambridge, it was a heart-wrenching day for those at Fiat Chrysler in Windsor. Our message to the auto workers in Windsor is clear. We're always going to fight for your auto jobs, and we're always going to fight for the auto sector. A few weeks ago, back in February, the Premier and I announced the first phase of our Opposition auto plan, driving prosperity, and uh, the Minister of Energy just last week made a commitment to review industrial electricity rates, particularly for the auto sector. We're investing in worker training, we're investing in research and innovation, we're cutting through the mountains and mountains of red tape, Mr. Speaker, that are making Ontario an uncompetitive jurisdiction. Thanks to the uh, former Liberal government supported by the NDP, we're not supporting the federal government's massive carbon tax imposed today on Ontarians, Fox. the one that the NDP want to see exploding to the highest carbon tax on the planet, Mr. Speaker. We won't stand for that. We're standing for jobs in Ontario. Stop the clock. I say to the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, the member for Scarborough, Guildwood, and the member for Waterloo, you can't yell across the floor at the other side. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, with your indulgence, I just want to take a minute to uh, thank all my colleagues from every side of the House for their messages of condolence and support over the week. Uh, I received a message from the Premier, a call from the Premier. I really appreciate it. The love and support from our leader and my entire caucus has meant the world to us. Speaker, my dad uh, fought for social justice, fairness and equality. I know he would want me to be here today. So unfortunately for the Premier and the government, the big tough guy is back in the House. So. <laughs> with, that, with, that, with that, Speaker, I know that today is April the 1st, so I half expect the Premier to pop up and let us all in on this elaborate prank that he's playing on us, because late last week the news broke that the Ford government was planning to rebrand Ontario license plates with one of their slogans from the campaign. Speaker, can the acting Premier tell us how much the taxpayers of Ontario will be paying for their mandatory PC party vanity plates? Wow. <laughs> Minister Finance. Thank you. And uh, uh, to you, Taras, I just want to say fathers never stop loving their sons, and sons never stop loving their fathers. Speaker, to the uh, Minister of Government and Consumer Services. 
Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, to the member for the question. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, Ontario has become a business-friendly province once again. We are open for business and we are open for jobs. And it would be only fitting that our commercial plates in one way or another reflect this. After 15 years of Liberal mismanagement, running our province into the ground, supported by the NDP, yeah. it's time that we say to the world, we are open for here, business, here. we are open for jobs. If we're up to the NDP, they would increase the cost of doing business in, in Ontario. They support the job-killing regressive carbon tax introduced yeah. by the federal Liberals, that raising costs for business, as well as anyone who owns a That's car, the heats their home, or buys groceries. Response. The fact, Mr. Speaker, for 15 years under the Liberals, Ontario businesses dealt with costly, burdensome regulations and yep. red tape that drove jobs out. We're we are doing the opposite. We're promoting we're open for business, we're open for jobs, and we're proud of that. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, the minister's response sadly proves that the joke is on the taxpayers of the yeah, province when we have to pay for vanity plates for uh, the Premier's ego. Speaker, the Premier clearly spends a lot of time thinking about cars and vans. We all remember the detailed blueprints he provided for the reclining leather couch in his personal pleasure wagon, but forcing cars to sport a vanity plate with a PC party slogan at taxpayers' expense that you can't keep off the books. Speaker, will the Acting Premier tell us what research the government has proving that the main barrier to attracting business in Ontario is a lack of appropriate messaging on license plates? And while he's at it, can he tell us how much this vanity project will cost the people of Ontario? Yeah. Members, please take their seats. Minister, to reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, to the member across, I can tell you it's a lot less than the Premier of Canada wants to do for the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this NDP opposition wants the highest carbon tax, not only in Ontario, not only in Canada, they want the highest tax in the world. Shame. We're going the other way. Shame. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, Shame. we have actually become a business-friendly province once again. Mr. Speaker, our government has actually lowered the cost across through the freezing of driver fees, Mr. Speaker, to make yeah. life more affordable. We're going to fight this regressive carbon tax point. to keep the cost of goods down across the province, Mr. Speaker. Point. We are committed to putting more money back in people's pockets and putting the people back at the center of everything we do, and we're proud under Premier Ford to say that Ontario is open for business. We're open for jobs, Go and we're going to promote that every opportunity we can, whether it be through license plates or signs at the border or just every day in our actions in our communities. We're open for business. We're open for jobs. Order. Restart the clock. The member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Speaker, uh, my question is for the Minister of Energy, uh, Northern Development of Mines, and the Minister of, uh, of Indigenous Affairs. Speaker, the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, or the NEAR program as it's called, has been crucial for major resource based industries in reducing their energy costs and maintaining the sustainability of their operations. Whether it's the mining, forestry, or the steel sectors, the NEAR program has substantially reduced costs for energy costs, allowing these major northern employers to continue to operate while they bring energy-efficient plans to their operations. Our previous government, in fact, made this program permanent, recognizing that this assistance was vital to the, to the successful long-term operation of these businesses. So, so my question to the minister is, will you continue to support our major northern industries through the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program? Thank you, Speaker. The Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the member's uh, question. Obviously, this subsidized program has been important to major industries, but it hasn't been enough. Frankly, Mr. Speaker, major forestry and mining operations are complaining about two important things from that last government's uh, legacy. The unpredictable and high cost still of energy to, to energize those uh, those forestry and resource operations, and of course the job-killing carbon tax, which we removed and now the federal Liberals uh, have implemented. I can't help but think, Mr. Speaker, that what's on the minds today 
of people who operate resource projects, forestry operations, mining operations, and manufacturing across Northern Ontario are thinking about this job-killing carbon tax. Presidents of colleges who cover massive regions of Northern Ontario Response. are thinking about the increased costs they're going to have to pay, Mr. Speaker, as a result of a job-killing carbon tax that was brought in by that government and has now been reintroduced by the federal Liberals, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Minister, I will take that as a yes. You will continue to support the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, a, a very important one for uh, all across the major resource industries across the north. Another program that provides benefits to Northerners is the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, which over the past 30 years has created or retained over 25,000 jobs all across the north. The, N the NOHFC is truly one of the key drivers of the northern economy and a vital part of future development in the north. So my question to the minister is this, a simple one. Can northerners expect that the fund will remain in place at its annual allotment so that all parts of the north will continue to benefit from this key economic development fund? Minister. Mr. Speaker, what northern Ontarians will continue to benefit from is a government that's committed to reducing costs, reducing costs for businesses, for forestry operations, and for mining operations, Mr. Speaker, making targeted and strategic investments uh, in businesses across uh, Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Just 10 more sleeps, the member will have the, some of the information uh, that he might need, and I can assure him that the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund will it. continue to be a key driver for creating economic opportunities across Northern Ontario. Unlike the job-killing carbon tax, ah. Mr. Speaker, which was introduced by that government, Mr. Speaker, make, making life more expensive for the people all across Northern Ontario, and now was reintroduced by the federal Liberals, Mr. Speaker. That's going to affect Response. Northern Ontario's economy, and we're going to hold those members of Parliament, uh, federal Parliament and the NDP opposition for wanting to have the highest carbon tax in the world, Mr. Jay Speaker. We will Stop the clock. Come inside, come to order. Start the clock. The next question is the member for Simcoe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. The daily duties of a police officer are dangerous, and they see tragedies that none of us would ever want to see. Police officers face a unique type of stress, and the current system isn't responsive to the realities frontline officers encounter on a daily basis. It is estimated that over a 30-year career, a frontline police officer is exposed to more than 900 traumatic events. These can include very serious incidents such as fatal car accidents, murder victims, sexual assault victims, and child fatalities. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please tell this House how our government is addressing the mental health crisis in the Ontario Provincial Police? Great question. Questions to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you. Um, I, I know this uh, member from Simcoe North knows this issue very well, considering the uh, OPP headquarters is located in Aurelia. So thank you for the question. Um, you know, in Ontario, we're heartbroken, knowing that 13 OPP officers have taken their own lives to suicide since 2012. My heart goes out to the families and the colleagues of these OPP. The OPP is facing a mental health crisis, and they should not have to face it alone. They have, the OPP have always answered the call when the people of Ontario have asked for their help, and our government is here to do the same for these courageous men and women. Last week, I was proud to announce with Rob Jamieson that our government is partnering with the Ontario Provincial Police Association to launch a new integrated mental health support program. This new program will provide seamless support to deliver the right treatments at the right time for both OPP officers and their families. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the minister for her response. It is reassuring to hear the OPP officers won't be left to face the challenges of stress and trauma alone. As a member of this government for the people, I am proud to stand here today and know that we are protecting our frontline officers just as they protect us. As the minister said, the OPP headquarters is in my riding of Simcoe North in Aurelia, but also personally, my partner is a police officer, so I know the stress our officers face. 
Mr. Speaker, could the minister please share more about how our government is providing services and supports to these everyday heroes? Minister. Thank you. So the uh, OPP officers and their families will have access to confidential and personalized mental health supports and services with this new program. These services will be accessed through a one-door approach to ensure the essential frontline workers can quickly and easily and confidentially be connected to the supports that they need and deserve. This new program will provide continuous support and guidance from beginning to end so that the patients receive the right treatment at the right time. We're aware that many officers serve in remote locations far from our urban centres where treatment is provided. These geographic barriers have prevented OPP officers from accessing the treatment they deserve in the past. We're changing that. We're going to use technology and innovation to break down those barriers and to ensure every OPP officer gets the help they need regardless of where they serve in Ontario. Thank you. Stop the clock for a second. Yeah, I want to remind all the members that the use of technology in the chamber is actually technically prohibited, but it, we've allowed members to use them if they're using them unobtrusively. Obviously, it's totally inappropriate to be taking photographs in the chamber during question period by any member, if that's happening. Start the clock. The next question, member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. As of today, vital overdose prevention services are operating without provincial funding. Six overdose prevention sites, including St. Stephen's Community House and Street Health, were thrown into chaos when their application to become a consumption and treatment centre was rejected. Just last week in Ottawa, five people died in five days of an overdose. But instead of investing in programs that save lives, this government has stopped funding for a site in Ottawa. Why is this government cutting overdose prevention services while people are dying? The Acting Premier. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Minister Services. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Speaker. You know, um, again, I will remind the member opposite and the NDP that the government on Friday announced 15 consumption treatment services. And in the interest of clarity, um, let's name those. The Fred Victor Centre in Toronto, the Parkdale Queen West Community Health Centre, the Parkdale Queen West Community Health Centre, the Regent Park Community Health Centre, the South Riverdale Community Health Centre, the South Riverdale Community Health Centre, the Toronto Public Health is on hold, but we are actively working on this file. And on the Minister of Health, the two parliamentary assistants wow. have been um, engaged in this file from, from when we were uh, appointed government. There are a lot of parts to this piece, and it is not, frankly, just about consumption. We need to make sure that. Stop the clock. Member for Ottawa Centre has to come to order. Member for Niagara Centre has to come to order. Member for Hamilton East Stony Creek has to come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Back to the Acting Premier. We've heard from organizations across the province that they could not meet the arbitrary requirements this government put in place to become a consumption and treatment site and are struggling to complete the onerous application process. Northern and rural communities that have fewer resources to jump these hurdles are being left without overdose prevention services for their communities. Speaker, the poisonous drug and opioid overdose crisis requires flexible response and immediate funding. When will the minister treat the poisonous drug and overdose crisis as the public health emergency it is and remove the barriers that the government has created in opening overdose prevention sites? Minister. Members, please take their seats. Minister. So I think it's important that the uh, NDP understand that the ministry has actively worked and is consulting with uh, individuals and municipalities who are providing these services. But let's be clear. 15 have been approved and are operating across Ontario. And the, the suggestion that in some way there are onerous application processes doesn't match with what is happening on, on the ground, and the reality is that 15 across the province of Ontario are engaged. We are continuing to uh, review applications. We are continuing to work with the, uh, the individuals providing the services and the municipalities 
municipalities, because communities also have a say in this. They want to be part of the conversation about what actually makes our streets safer, Response. what actually provides the service that people are looking for. And it's not only about consumption sites, it's about treatment, it's about access to things that will actually improve people's lives. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Our government was elected to make Ontario open for business and open for jobs. One of the bedrock industries in Ontario is the aggregate industry, which supplies raw materials needed to build the things we depend on, like our homes, hospitals, schools, and bridges, all while providing thousands of quality, well-paying jobs. I was pleased to see that our government hosted an aggregate summit with the industry on Friday in Bolton, and that we are continuing to reduce red tape and create uh, that creates a burden on industry. Can the minister update the House on the work we are doing to support the development that is beneficial to this sector? Questions to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for his question and for his advocacy for open for business, open for jobs. I was pleased that so many of my colleagues were able to join me for that summit, uh, including the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services, my colleague, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, my parliamentary assistant, Mr. Barrett, and the member from Peter Peterborough Kawartha. We had a pro very productive morning on Friday. We met with industry and municipal and industrial partners to discuss how we can reduce barriers while maintaining our commitment to mani managing potential impacts from aggregate extraction. Speaker, the previous government built barriers. Our government will always support development that builds our communities as we make Ontario open for business and open for jobs. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for that answer, Mr. Speaker. I know that my constituents agree with the Ontario Stone, Sand and Gravel Association, who welcome the message from the minister that the province is now open for business. The aggregate industry is, a, is an important driver to our economy and critically important to our quality of life. And we need to continue to reduce barriers that create an environment for growth and a sustainable resource sector. It is important that the industry is able to provide, to provide input as we find solutions that work for everyone. Could the minister update the House on the information taken from the aggregate summit? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member for his question. As we look at how Ontario manages pits and quarries, we want to work. We want to hear from everyone on, a, on a, how we can improve upon this framework. I invite everyone interest, interested in aggregate reform to submit their comments if they have not done so already. As the member has said, aggregates are the raw materials that help build our schools, our homes, our hospitals, our bridges, and our roads and are the foundation of industries that strengthen our economy and create high-quality, well-paying jobs. What some in this House may not be aware is the environmental leadership shown by the industry as they use innovative techniques to rehabilitate former aggregate sites. I'd like to close by thanking all the attendees at the Aggregate Summit. Our gov government values their input as we make Ontario open for business and open for jobs. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Minister of Education. I recently had the privilege of meeting with 40 grade 10 students from Resurrection Catholic Secondary School. I'll be sending their concerns over to the Minister. Uh, we had a spirited discussion about the changes and the cuts that are coming to their education system. Mr. Speaker, they're smart, and that's why they're worried about how this government's plans are going to affect their education. For example, the students already do some co coursework online, so I asked them, how many of you prefer for online classes over classroom learning. Not one student put up their hand. But under the new plan, they will be forced to spend hours online, and they won't be able to graduate unless they do so. Speaker, why did the minister not consult with students in the province of Ontario on these changes? It is their system, after all. Questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question. And I'd like to start off by saying, you know what? We have to make sure, you know, the, the member opposite referenced the fact that students are smart. Yes, they are. And we need to enable them to utilize every tool available to them and in, to, in order to move them forward and push that bar. And that's why we're excited about the e-learning that we're bringing forward to Ontario from one quarter to another. And do you know what? Actually, I have teachers 
I have parents, and I also have students that are excited about the plan that we have. They're embracing it because they realize that in so many cases, from board to board, it's already happening. And so, you know, we're going to be working with our education partners to make sure we get it right. But for all intents and purposes, when the rhetoric's not presented first, Response. people love the plan that we're bringing forward. Exactly. Thank you very much. Very Supplementary. Thank you very much. You know, the Minister of Education should be focused on creating an education system that puts students at the centre of it. That's how you build a strong public education system. So, speaker, speaker, these cuts will affect students. Students who want to grow up and become plumbers, teachers, doctors, auto workers, they have no idea what their next year of school will look like because of this government. During the discussions, one student asked, so is the government doing this all just for money? These changes don't make sense to them or anyone in education. So students see right through this government, Mr. Speaker. And because of this minister, students are now convinced that money is more important than their education system. No. Speaker, a quality public education system will serve everyone better in the long run. That is how you build a strong democracy. So why is this government balancing the budget on the backs of students in the province of Ontario? Members, please take their seats. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Speaker. And you know what? No one is buying any of the rhetoric that is coming no. from that None. side of the House. No. None. Yeah. Zero. Zilch. Speaker, we listened to 72,000 people, and they have been absolutely sincere in their input and with their desire to get education back on track after 15 years of experiments and ill-conceived ideologies that led this past government to fail our students. And people from one corner of this province to the other are excited that we're finally, the PC government of Ontario, is finally getting education back on track. We're going to be focusing on the basics. We're focusing on math. We're focusing on financial literacy. We're focusing on STEM. We're focusing on making sure they graduate with the skills, Response. both job skills and life skills, that they need to be successful. And you know what, Speaker? People can't wait to hear more about what we're going here, to be here, doing. Here, here. So Somebody stay tuned and be engaged. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. The question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. For 15 years, the previous Liberal government treated Northern Ontario as an afterthought. The tragic consequences of their neglect has meant that investment and jobs have left Ontario for other jurisdictions as mills closed and resource development projects simply never got started. Now we have the federal Liberal Bill C-69 which will add unnecessary delays and hurdles to the approval process, putting even more jobs in the resource sector at risk. Can the minister update the House on how our government is standing up for the people of Northern Ontario as we make the province open for business and open for jobs? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question for the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, and his support in joining us with the fight against all of these barriers that Northern Ontario has faced over the course of time. It's true, Mr. Speaker, the job-killing carbon tax imposed by the previous Liberal government here in Ontario and now set to implement today. A buck thirty-five-three a litre, Mr. Speaker, in Thunder Bay. A buck forty in Ear Falls this morning, Mr. Speaker. A dollar thirty-something in Kenora. The people of Northern Ontario are madder than a bunch of stomped-on polecats. But, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that I take great comfort in the strategic investments that we're making across Northern Ontario. Algoma Steel, Lake of the Woods Brewing Company, helping out the forest uh, sector. The Minister of Natural Resources' masterful job, Mr. Speaker, on developing a new provincial strategy for forestry, Mr. Speaker. And we're thinking those folks in Response. Fort Francis, Mr. Speaker, and our support for them in ensuring that they have a vital economy, Mr. Speaker, in the forest sector moving forward. We're standing up for jobs uh, for people across Northern here, here. Ontario, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question? Thank you to the Minister for that answer, Mr. Speaker. In the forestry sector alone, tens of thousands of jobs were lost under the previous Liberal government. 
The sector continues to deal with the aftereffects of a government that prioritized the concerns of special interests groups and environmental radicals. And this happened with the unwavering support of the NDP. It's reassuring to see that Northern Ontario finally has ministers that care about the people and jobs in the North. Northern Ontario welcomes the repeal of the Far North Act and the development of a provincial forestry strategy. Can the minister please share with the House how these measures will help ensure that Northern Ontario is once again open for business and open for jobs? Minister. To the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister. To the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I again ask, uh, thank the member for the question. And I would just like to take a moment to recognize the hard work done by the uh, Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines on this file. He has been a passionate advocate for Northern Ontario in Cabinet and Caucus, and it was absolutely wonderful to have him participate in our forestry roundtable in Kenora earlier. There are challenges facing the forestry industry in Ontario, no question, and many of them were brought, brought about by the uh, lack of understanding and, and the ignoring of the problems by the previous Liberal government. And that is why it's been so important for us to hold these forestry roundtables. We've had a chance to hear directly from the sector about the problems they faced for the past 15 years and what we can do to remove some of those barriers to Response. success in that industry. We are going to show that Ontario is once again open for business, open for jobs, and show our commitment to this industry that is sustainable for generations to come if it is treated properly. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Attic Hilton. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The frontline Thunder Bay staff at the Ontario Child and Youth Advocate Office are packing up. Indigenous youth in the North are losing their services and their advocates. That means Indigenous youth in care will have nowhere to turn when they need help. Where will they turn when their caseworkers aren't listening or understanding, when they want to return to their communities or their plan for care falls apart? Minister, why are you leaving Indigenous youth in care with nowhere to turn when they need help? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I'd like to thank the member opposite for her question. It's a very important question as we talk about children in custody and in care, and in particular children um, who are in care that are Indigenous. And we are committed as a government to expanding children's aid societies that are Indigenous-led with customary care throughout Ontario. Uh, as I've mentioned many times in this House, I think that's a strong legacy for us to build on and I think where we can be leaders in the rest of the country. Let me be perfectly clear. We are committed to improving the outcomes of Ontario's child protection system through the creation of three new roundtables dedicated to sharing ideas for improvement. One of these will be Indigenous-led for children in care, and they, they will consist of those with lived experience in the fields of Indigenous child welfare. The others will be children in care and youth in custody. Their membership will have direct access to decision makers, including myself, and that is why we are committed as a government and as a ministry to ensuring the, the greatest Response. protection of all of our children. But this was a decision made in the fall economic statement uh, by the Ministry of Finance, and that's why we are proceeding the way we are. Supplementary. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. There is no plan. There is no plan to ensure Indigenous youth in care have uninterrupted access to advocacy services. We are talking about some of the most vulnerable children and youth in our province who are slow to trust and with good reason. When they have a problem, they will be asking, where is my advocate? Minister, where is the plan? Minister. Uh, thanks, Speaker. Um, perhaps the member opposite didn't listen to the, uh, the first response. The plan is, is this. We have moved investigative powers over and the over oversight powers over to the Ombudsman, who we believe can provide us with stringent and uh, robust uh, support, and he is an independent officer of this assembly, or we are working with him. In addition, we are expanding Indigenous-led child welfare agencies across the province of Ontario. I'm proud of that. We're, we're leaders in Canada. We're leaders in North America. That's
that's important. I've indicated to the member opposite that those children who are Indigenous uh, that uh, will be part of a roundtable discussion that will speak directly to me as a table, as well as other decision makers, so we can improve child welfare protection in the province of Ontario. In addition, as I've mentioned many times in this legislature, we will be embedding within my ministry a, a child advocate who will report directly to Response. me so we can take change. Thank you very much, Speaker. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General and responsible for Francophone Affairs. We just celebrated the Francophony Week, and it's important for the government to do. Last Friday, the Attorney General and responsible for Francophone Affairs went to Sudbury to say good news. She launched a pilot project for better access to justice in French. Can the Attorney General can talk about a visit to Sudbury, the announcement that she made, and the people she met in Sudbury? I wish to thank the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, I went to Sudbury to see the Justice Court. I was able to meet people from francophone paralegals. I had the pleasure to announce a new initiative from the government to improve access justice service in French. The collaboration of tribunals and other people will improve access to justice in French, to have better support and services in French, for that this access fa be faster. Complimentary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to thank the Attorney General to continue the work she's done before to support the French development through the province for a quick access to justice in French is very important. I know that the minister responsible for French francophone affairs have met a few people and underline the investment in the cultural infrastructure in Sudbury. Can she talk about other discussions she had with francophone in Sudbury? Procureur General, Mr. Speaker, we will support to a better access in French. We'll invest $3 million in the larger Sudbury, and I had the pleasure to be there with the members of Sudbury for Sudbury and Nickel Belt. La Place des Arts will be a gathering place for those who love art and will contribute to the cultural life in Ontario. On the other hand, I went to see Boreal College and I met people with the Caisse Populaire. We discussed of their support to Bill 66 to eliminate the obstacle to development. Can Ms. document has been tabled. Order in Council 490-2019, dated March 28, 2019, appointing Diana Cook as the temporary provincial advocate for children and youth, effective April 1, 2019, to May 1, 2019. I know the uh, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services has a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Appreciate that. I wanted to introduce seven uh, representatives from Diabetes Canada. Please indulge me in welcoming Matt, Ethan, Seppeline, Dawn, Stacy, Charlene, and Jake Reed. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you, Speaker. I rise on a port of order to congratulate my CA, uh, my CA Nicole A. Ott, and her husband Joel on the birth of their first child. So, on, 
On behalf of the provincial legislator, I'd like to welcome three-year-old Isaac Gilliott to the city of Greater Sudbury. Uh, the member for Waterloo on a point of order. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just want to welcome John Tibbetts, who's the president of Conestoga College here to Queen's Park today. Thank you. The member for Orléans on a point of order. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I wish to welcome to La Cité and a team who made a presentation this morning. I want to thank them for the work they do in Orléans and in the greater Ottawa region. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, I just heard uh, you say that you tabled the appointment of the uh, temporary uh, child advocate. And I just want to point out, it's always been a practice in this place that the government, in consultation with the recognized parties, goes through a process by which we agree on who's going to be one of those officers. I realize this is just for a month, but I want to put you on notice. This should have been something that you talked to the official opposition about, and you did not. It's not a valid point of order, but obviously the message has been sent. The member for Humber River Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. I just want to welcome David Agnew, president of Seneca College. This house stands in recess until 1 p.m.